Uh, well, welcome everyone to KubeCon North America 2020. Uh, excited to give you a presentation today around uh, a very interesting SIG within Kubernetes, uh, SIG architecture. And hopefully we can give you a, a background and how you can get engaged and what our role within the project is. Um, so we go to the next slide. Uh, uh, I'm Derek Carr. I've been active in the Kubernetes. So the slide's not progressing, John. There we go. <laughs> there we go. All right, virtual event. Well, I'm Derek Carr. I'm a, I work at Red Hat. I've been active in the Kubernetes community since uh, its early inception. Uh, presently serve on the steering committee and participate in SIG architecture and SIG node. And I'm joined today by uh, John. Hi, I'm John Bellamerick uh, from I'm at Google, and I've been involved in Kubernetes uh, since uh, maybe, well, so probably since late 2016, but uh, primarily in SIG Network, and then uh, later in the last uh, year or two in SIG Architecture. So uh, those are my primary areas of focus. Awesome. Well, hopefully with the two of us here, we can do a good job explaining how to engage in, in Kubernetes. All right, um, so let's take a step back and like remind everybody about the goals of the Kubernetes uh, project. Um, you know, the project is is maturing. It's it, it's, uh, but it's grounded by the goals that we've set out from its inception, right? Where we wanted uh, Kubernetes to be portable across multiple clouds. We want it to be kind of general purpose, not too opinionated. We want people to find value in multiple places, and that requires us to to meet users where they are. Uh, and with that, when we design uh, the project and the subsystems within, we want to ensure that we offer flexibility, extensibility, and points of uh, integration or specialization to allow people to, to ultimately meet their needs. Um, as a project, we aspire a lot to ensure that uh, most of our procedures and practices are, are automated uh, rather than manual. And we want to always ensure that like, as a project, we don't stagnate and we recognize that users' needs and platforms evolve. And so we want to make sure that we can keep promoting uh, stable evolution of the project. So with those like framing goals in mind, we kind of go to the next slide here and we try to say like, well, those are great goals and they, they uh, hopefully allow the Kubernetes project to maintain long-term success. But that only works if we back it up with, with uh, community values that allow activities to scale. So one of the earliest things we did within Kubernetes was to uh, define a governance model that prioritized uh, distribution of um, uh, responsibility among various uh, groups within the project, rather than centralizing all decision making within a, a small uh, few of uh, individuals. Um, generally, we think if you know about networking, you should be uh, exercising your domain and networking knowledge and have autonomy within that SIG and same with, you know, node or, or scheduling. Um, those people who work closest to that uh, problem space know it best. Um, and when we interface within the community, we wanna make sure that we're representing the community rather than an individual uh, uh, product or company need, uh, because uh, by doing that, we're ensuring that everyone uh, is, is ultimately being successful. Um, as a community, you know, we always strive to do better and uh, SIG architecture is no different than the rest. So we, we want to make sure that we're inclusive and in hearing everyone's uh, viewpoints. So uh, if after seeing this presentation, you're inspired to join us in a SIG architecture meeting, I'm sure John or myself or anybody else who participates would, would love to get your feedback and, and help make your impact known in the community. Um, and then the key point here on the community values, when we talked about the project wanting to ensure that it keeps advancing the state of the art, we need to ensure that like our community values evolve uh, and don't stagnate themselves. So with that context in mind, if we go to the, the next slide, um, the Kubernetes project itself, as we said, is composed of many SIGs. And there's kind of different ways you can look at SIGs. Some are very um, horizontally oriented, right? So they they deal with the guts of how the Kubernetes project itself works, maybe the underlying API machinery or how authentication, and then some are more vertically oriented, like scheduling, uh, the node, networking, uh, storage. And then we have this specialized kind of uh, group of SIGs, which we kind of look at from the project-wide perspective. And SIG architecture was one of those early SIGs um, that while it doesn't have individual domain uh, responsibility for any of those horizontal or vertical aligned areas. We do aspire to ensure that we can provide 
sufficient guidance and uh, uh, lessons learned across the Kubernetes community as a whole to ensure that every individual SIG is not repeating or encountering the same problems. And so today, when John and I talk through um, the SIG's ultimate responsibilities, hopefully you'll see that the, the projects and practices we have running help uh, keep ensuring that Cube as a whole is successful. And so we'll go to the next slide. Sure. So as, uh, as Derek said, SIG architecture fits as a sort of project scope uh, um, SIG. And um, with that concept of uh, distribution is better than centralization, we, we still see this need for sort of consistency and for a consistent bar across the project for um, uh, that is bar of quality and also for things like APIs, we have a consistent set of conventions that we want to use so that the APIs from SIG network and the APIs from SIG node function in essentially the same manner, and not just the machinery, but the structure of the API and the conventions around naming and things like that. Um, those general API conventions, design principles, you know, we're using uh, declarative APIs with these uh, reconciling controllers, things like that, that are just fundamental to Kubernetes, those live within this, uh, within this SIG. Um, in addition, we work on some of these um, cross-cutting policies. So things like uh, how we deprecate features and APIs um, and the process by which we improve Kubernetes. Um, so what are some of the other issues? Um, so it happens sometimes that, that a question will come up through a SIG that the, the SIG doesn't know how to answer. They, they want to make sure that it works uh, in a consistent manner across what other SIGs may be doing. Um, and those sort of things will come to SIG architecture to make decisions about or have discussions about. Um, sometimes SIGs will disagree, the people within the SIG will disagree. And you know, at times they brought that to us as an escalation. We're really not an escalation point because again, distribution is better than centralization. It, we're, not, we're not lording over all the other SIGs. We're setting policies across the project. And um, so when those things come to us, we're not going to be overriding SIG decisions, but what we might be doing is talking about how those decisions might be made, uh, you know, in, in, or what principles apply that might be repeatable within that decision-making process. Um, so the, uh, well, I'm not sure what this last bullet is here. <laughs> I didn't put it on here, but uh, in general, um, we do, uh, like to solicit feedback from anybody in order to do that. Uh, you start a thread on our mailing list, which is SIG Architecture, you're, you're happy to join it. And once once we've got a thread going, we try and resolve what we can on there before we actually talk about it in a meeting to try and uh, be respectful of every, everybody's time. So sub-projects. Um, we have five sub-projects within, within uh, SIG Architecture. Um, one is the uh, the API review subproject, which essentially um, documents all of those conventions and design principles around the API, um, and also runs uh, a, an actual review process where every time there's a, a PR that comes in that touches an API, um, there's a set of reviewers and approvers who will review that change, make sure that it's adhering to those conventions and um, uh, often give very good advice around how to improve your API. So um, it's, a, it's a really valuable process uh, that, we've, um, that we've seen and we've gotten great results out of. We also have a code organization subproject. So here again is one of these larger structural things uh, that the SIG handles. And this is about managing our dependencies um, and deciding what, what pieces of code can be moved out. We've, we've got a set of staging repositories that allow us to um, uh, sort of uh, refactor the code a little more effectively and be able to import the code into other projects more effectively. Uh, so that's all managed by code organization. Um, conformance definition, we talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, that's the group that manages the conformance testing process, decides which tests are, uh, uh, are to be deemed uh, required for conformance. Um, 
in, in effect defining what Kubernetes is. Uh, the enhancement sub project is new since the last um, KubeCon here. It actually moved over from SigPM, which shut down. And um, that manages our Kubernetes enhancement proposal process. And uh, that means how our engineers in the community can sort of uh, get consensus around the features that they want to build and add, and how we can manage the the progression of those features through uh, alpha, beta, and stable release and ensure the, the quality bar. Um, as an adjunct to that, we've also recently added this production readiness review project, um, which uh, runs a process something like the API review process, but it's not reviewing code generally, it's reviewing uh, a specialized section of the cap. So we've defined a set of questions that um, that, you, that, that developers must answer to ensure that the pieces of the functionality and features we're adding to Kubernetes meet a, a bar of supportability. Awesome. Well, thanks, John. So uh, many folks who are new to engaging with Kubernetes, um, uh, when we talk about these sub-projects, they are literally like dedicated meetings that um, uh, folks can join and participate in if they have a particular interest. And so while SIG architecture meets um, uh, at a SIG-wide level uh, at a bi-weekly cadence and topics for that meeting are usually generated through the mailing list, um, individual sub-projects, which John gave an overview on, have discrete meeting times to just focus on that particular uh, activity as well. Um, so one of those ones uh, that we can talk a little about was around API review. A lot of people who engage with Kubernetes appreciate the fact that it has a relatively consistent API uh, perspective. Um, API review as a thing in the project uh, was not something that um, uh, w was ultimately something that very few reviewers within the community had maybe the overall breadth of awareness and knowledge uh, in the early formation of Kubernetes to ensure that that consistency happened. Uh, within the API review sub project though, now we're trying to figure out ways to scale uh, that review process out further, um, but ensure that we don't lower our standards and that as new questions arise that we document those outcomes. So there's a project board if you're interested in checking out uh, the activities that take place uh, in that sub project. And as well, if you're just interested in understanding like the design philosophy around APIs and changing your APIs that Kubernetes aspires to follow, even in your own extension projects, which we talk about later, like as an ecosystem, it's great if we can all be aligned. Uh, I strongly encourage everyone to look at our API conventions document. It's like really deep and thorough and can help people build um, APIs that uh, fit Kubernetes style, even when they're not in the Kubernetes project. Now, API review is required for anything that is in the main Kubernetes, Kubernetes uh, distribution. So when we talk about the goal of the community being portable, right, no matter where you procure Kubernetes, you want it to work uh, consist consistently. We do recognize that there's a, a growing ecosystem of projects around Kubernetes. And so you might've seen some things come up around things like uh, the usage of the Kates.io uh, API namespace versus say like an x dash Kates.io namespace. And so where we talk through things around what things are subject to API review and uh, the process around that, that's a lot of things that you might see in the sub project and we would love uh, participation. Um, but there's a lot of great lessons and, and things to learn. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, code organization as John talked about, like Kubernetes was originally just one massive repo, right? Kubernetes, Kubernetes. And we are building on the output of many other open source communities to openly do what we do in Kubernetes, right? Whether that is uh, some of our earliest dependencies were C Advisor or Run C or Docker or uh, any of the other projects you might see get vendored into a typical Go project. Well, over time, this gets this just gets crazy. <laughs> and um, it slows down uh, progress in the community because you have a lot of um, folks all trying to work within one mono repo and getting vendoring uh, alignment to work well is sometimes difficult. And then you sometimes have challenges where people try to consume individual libraries or subsystems within Kubernetes in their discrete projects 
and they don't want to bring the entire Kubernetes source tree with them. And so I would say in the last, I don't correct me if I'm wrong, John, maybe in the last year or two, we've gotten probably far more disciplined on our approach to this. And so the, the code organization sub project kind of was born out of that desire to realize, oh, we got to do things better. Um, and so basically if you're interested in like taking a very large Go project and figuring out the best way to structure it across uh, a reasonable number of repositories that uh, all of us in the community can follow, like this is this is the place for you. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, as well as if you're interested in, in uh, consuming particular sub systems within Kubernetes for use in your project that may not be well factored yet to meet your need. I think everyone in the community wants to help others, um, but they want to help it in a way that they know that they're providing that help on. And so making those, those issues known uh, can help us figure out then, as John talked about earlier, what things we should maybe promote into their own discrete repo that you can depend on without the whole thing. So that's, that's code organization and uh, going to the next one. Uh, conformance tests and promotion. Uh, so this is a process that is important um, and one that is uh, ever evolving. So Kubernetes rapidly expanded in its earliest uh, formations and the actual set of projects, typically many things had EDE testing, right? We wanted to make sure the feature worked, but not everything was uh, labeled as conformant. Um, and for a variety of good reasons, right? There were maybe integrations specific to particular cloud platforms that were not necessarily portable. Um, and, uh, uh, but you still wanna make sure that that function worked, right? And so while we have a very large and rich body of, of EDE testing within the project, and of course these things can always improve, that which was required to be portable across everywhere you can consume Kubernetes is, 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 um, is a smaller set and, uh, you know, has to be expanded judiciously, right? Um, and so the conformance test and promotion subproject is basically evaluating that problem, right? How do we identify the right set of tests, the right set of function that should and must be portable across all um, areas of which you can consume Kubernetes? And then where we had uh, maybe project debt, where we lack sufficient testing, um, we are now trying to go back and say, well, what can we do to supplement uh, the, those gaps within our testing? Um, and then on a forward going basis, how do we ensure that our project postures and positions like don't allow those gaps to reinsert them back, uh, reinsert themselves back? So one of the key things that came out of uh, SIG architecture was like this, this clarifying statement that like, uh, you know, you need to have these tests before you can promote your feature to beta, right? They might not be labeled yet for conformance, but they're at least in the project and ready to go in case uh, we know things actually were being properly tested. So um, if you're interested in helping uh, define and enhance and enrich uh, what Kubernetes means, no matter where you consume it, uh, the conformance test and, and promotion project is a, is a great place to engage with that. And the last sub project here is around enhancements. Um, the history lesson of Kubernetes is sometimes useful, which is we, we had a small group of engineers kind of collaborating and we kind of had a rough idea of let's write some design documents on what we want to do, but that wasn't really very formal. And then we kind of evolved that a little bit and we stuck things in a cube community repo and kind of threw our ideas out there, had an ad hoc way of, of, of getting a consensus among uh, the maintainer community. And then as you can imagine over years, Kubernetes just has grown, right? And so we needed to scale that process. And so now uh, we have this enhancement sub project where we have a standard enhancement template that says, this is the change I wanna make. This is how that change can be tracked uh, by the release team. This is how we know that a test was being uh, implemented and executed for this enhancement. Uh, this is how we can appropriately document that things got into the website documentation so our users know how to consume the feature. Um, and then a clear set of like, what is the use case my feature is trying to do? What component areas does it impact? And then we, from that, we can kind of build a map of like helping you navigate the community to know these are who you need to approve. These are the SIGs you need to go and engage. 
um, and ultimately hopefully get your feature idea into the project. Um, I would say that this is this is a an ever evolving process. I think we've learned a lot, and John would agree as we go through caps on on how things are. Uh, and so if you've wanted to write a cap or you've reviewed a cap or you've read a cap or you have a new idea, if you want to suggest a, a tweak or a change to the process, uh, please engage with the enhancements of project because we're always trying to figure out ways to better automate this and, and uh, drive attention to it. And so with that, uh, go ahead, John. Uh, yeah, so uh, along those lines, one thing that was recently added to the gap process was the idea of production, production readiness review. So um, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but um, this really tries to get, you know, developers in our community are, you know, top-notch professional folks, but they're also developers, meaning they think about their users and how their users are going to make use of these features to uh, to do whatever it's going to do, do. Those users are typically application developers that they're thinking about because those are the features they're mostly building for. So production readiness review is intended to um, to shift uh, to shift the, the the thinking a little bit uh, from to the to the operator point of view. So as a person operating this cluster um, who doesn't necessarily care about the specific features that they're that 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 might be offered by a SIG but they care about making sure those features are working properly. So um, how can the operator best uh, ensure that whatever you're adding uh, is serving your, your, your users? Um, so typically what that means is making sure you've got good metrics, uh, making sure that you have a way to turn the feature off, making sure that you can roll back the feature, uh, making sure that, that those metrics can tell you not only that the features in use, um, but that is actually working as expected. Um, so uh, that's some of the, the the set of questions now that are part of the cap pr process. And uh, essentially those questions are broken down into when you're going to alpha, here's the things you have to have already figured out. When you're going to beta, here's the things you have to have already figured out. Here's when you're going to stable and you know, with the bar obviously notching up each each step of the way. And like API review, there's a set of uh, a, a set of um, community members who are uh, PRR approvers, and they actually will need to look over the answers to those questions and um, work with the author of the CAP to make sure that the questions meet um, meet the needs of operators and, and the point of view of this, this process. So um, this is pretty new. Uh, we've piloted it in uh, 119 and 120, uh, and it will be mandatory in 121. So um, folks that are writing CAPs um, it was more or less mandatory to write it in 120, but it wasn't a blocking thing if it didn't get approved. Uh, in 121 now, um, we will potentially block uh, advancing your cap or concluding it in the release unless you've filled this out to our satisfaction. <laughs> um, of course, we will work with you in any way we can to make sure uh, we, that, uh, that the feature uh, meets, the, meets the bar here. And I don't think for most folks, it's a hard bar to meet. It's just... Now we have it documented. Now operators that, that um, and and, uh, and providers that consume Kubernetes and distribute Kubernetes uh, actually have a playbook built in right there for how to handle certain situations. Excellent, John. So, like, maybe one way we can think about uh, Kubernetes now is like, obviously, it's a uh, it's a container orchestration system at heart, but it, it has grown to be kind of more than that, right? It's basically a platform for building higher order platforms. Um, one of the things that uh, we often experience in Kubernetes, whether it's at the individual discrete SIG level or those who want to engage with SIG architecture is, you know, folks have great ideas, right? They want to use the enhancement process uh, to propose their new feature. They're, they're ready to sign up for their production readiness review. They got their API all spec'd out. They want to get their API review, um, and they're just you know ready to go. Um, and so, John, I heard that you had an idea for an awesome feature you wanted to add to Kubernetes, and maybe we could kind of talk through uh, a right way of navigating uh, your interaction with the community. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I have I have a little side project I've got going where I'm trying to build build my own um, uh, launch platform 
for uh, rockets that go to the moon. And that, that, the thing is that I, I haven't been able to build the rocket, you know, quite, quite good enough to reach the moon, um, except if I time it just right so that, you know, the, the rocket will reach the moon right as it, its closest approach to Earth. So I was thinking that I would build a, a model um, that, that models the, the, the orbit of the moon and when it, uh, and how long it will take the rocket to get there and then calculate exactly when the rocket needs to launch. But the problem is that, you know, uh, with cron job, all I can do is schedule like on these periodic intervals, right? I, I can't plug that in. Like, how do I, I want to build my own controller that can model, you know, can include or my own scheduler, that, or whatever it is. Do you tell me I want to yeah. build something so that uh, I can fire at the right time? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's it's rockets you're dealing with, right? So I assume the users you're working with or your 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 community you're representing are probably uh, 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 both important and uh, full of cash and engineering know-how to want to make this uh, possible, right? And also, you want to get that rocket to space. So uh, you probably want to be able to deliver that value to your user at a, at a prompt cadence, right? So maybe what we could do is uh, ask, is that the right thing to get into Kubernetes? Um, so if we go to the next slide, uh, I think as a Kubernetes community, uh, like our goal with engaging with you, John, is like we want to make you successful. We don't want you to be bottlenecked on our API review process, on the cap process, on the um, production readiness process. If like that feature isn't broadly applicable to everyone who potentially could be consuming Kubernetes. Now, I'm a little anxious that the use case you described might be very you know, bespoke, but still important. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind is like when you're asking to make a change of that magnitude, like a new workload controller or a new uh, fundamental capability, when we talk about the alpha, beta, stable progression, that, that takes time, right? That sometimes is measured in order of a year, maybe a little bit more, because you're going through discrete lease periods. And so, it's actually often better if you can fulfill your use case using one of the building blocks that Kubernetes already exposes without you need to get it into the core of Kubernetes, right? Because uh, as, as we said, distribution is better than, than centralization. I don't want you to be successful if, if and only if we bless your use case in the Kubernetes project. So to that, to that concept, I would say one of the things in the Kubernetes community we've done is is listen closely for where new extensions are needed. So let's, maybe if we go to the next slide, we can talk through your example, right? So like you, you, you have a new API design, you have a new model, it sounds like a variant on jobs. Like, have you, have you looked at CRDs? Have you, are you familiar with that concept and what they would provide? Um, no, tell me more about that. I don't know, I, I, I've never, uh, uh, all I heard is Kubernetes is really great and really solid and I wanna make sure that it can do what I need it to do, so. Yeah, so like uh, we have a lot of built-in APIs in Kubernetes that you're probably familiar with, things like pods and the job thing you were looking at. But like there's a, there's a, a scope to what we offer within the community and then an ability for you to kind of write that new thing yourself, right? So one of the capabilities that was added was uh, is things called custom resource definitions, right? So you can define a schema for your new job type and you can then use, you can tell that to Kubernetes, this is my schema, and then you can uh, produce instances of that object and write controllers against that. So if you're wanting to use like Kubernetes as a platform to build controllers over an arbitrary data model, and you want it to follow the Kubernetes design principles, I think I would encourage you to look at custom resource definitions and experiment outside of Kubernetes first. So you're saying I could build something that works almost just like a built-in type with like almost just like cron job, but I wouldn't have to modify Kubernetes itself. Yes. And you uh, could be very successful for you and your users without being uh, necessarily gatekeeped by the project uh, overall pace and community. And there's some other things like you, you talk about, you want to be able to operate those things, right? So there's nothing, uh, you probably want to use the CLI to like figure out what's going on with this object, right? Like you call okay. control get pods and you you know your thing's running. So one of the things that we've done is you can now, you know, using that custom resource definition, kind of advertise how it gets um, displayed 
in the CLI user experience. So like if there's particular attributes you want to show about when that rocket needs to launch or when that job needs to run, uh, I think you could you can make your users very happy and your operators very happy by, by exploring that. Um, now, I don't think there's anything particular about your use case that requires custom scheduling. <laughs> and I'm afraid to ask in too much detail, but I would say like if, we, if we've stopped poking on John's custom example, there's a lot of other areas within Kubernetes that people can extend and enrich without needing to get their code base into the core of Kubernetes itself. Um, and I think as a, as a project community, we spend a lot of time trying to ensure that those can be successful building on top of us or around us. Um, and that we recognize there might be exit points where not everything has been defined. Uh, but if John had an alternative example where he could identify a particular uh, use case or nuance that's probably applicable that would empower him to do something else, I would say coming to SIG architecture to talking through your initial challenge or thought is is a uh, is a good thing, but our first reaction will be to try to ask if we have the right tools and mechanisms in place to enable you to be successful by building on top of rather than within Kubernetes. Um, so thanks, John, for for placating that. <laughs> uh, so, yep, go ahead, John. Uh, so then the question then is wh where do we go from here? Um, so. Uh, really, the entire community has been focused on these extensions that Derek was just talking about. We really want to make sure that we have the right extension points. Um, and, and so there's a big focus on that, continues to be. And that those extension points work as much as possible, like built-in types. Um, we also, um, uh, we're continuing to build out coverage and conformance, and um, we're trying to improve the quality of the dot zero release, um, and we're sort of trying to improve the overall flow of features through this system. So we have a, a something that was recently added where uh, um, things need to go to GA at some point. We've had too many things that linger in beta for years, and that, that's a problem for us. So these are the, the main things we're looking at, as well as you know ensuring the project continues to scale, and, and we also uh, make sure that, uh, that, that that kept process works properly. So, how can you participate in this? Um, well, as Derek mentioned, come to our meetings. We have uh, a community meeting every other week. Um, that's for the general SIG architecture. And then uh, most of projects also have a, um, a meeting every other week. Um, the schedules are there on the, the, the community schedule. And um, we are uh, really uh, eager to have you come and join us and, and help us out. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you. And hopefully we're here to answer questions live now. So uh, thanks again.